Chapter 1 On Fire for God A life of fire, a life ablaze with God. This surely describes God's servant, Smith Wigglesworth. In one of his letters to me, dated November 21, 1940, he writes, Pleased to receive the news of much blessing on your ministry, especially in souls being saved and God keeping you in a very hungry and needy place. We will remember you this weekend at Doncaster. Do not preach too long. Draw the net before the people are tired. This keeps you fresh and them also. Repeat in your heart often, baptized with the Holy Ghost, and fire, fire, fire. All the unction and weeping and travailing comes through the baptism of fire. And I say to you and say to myself, purged and cleansed and filled with renewed spiritual power. God bless you. His servant, Smith Wigglesworth. Smith Wigglesworth was unique. He was a commanding figure, finely built, with twinkling small eyes and a stout face, rugged and refined at the same time, always immaculately dressed in a dark suit. It was a part of his belief that the Lord looked after his own. I've heard him say that if he ever came to a place where he had less than three decent suits, he would know the Lord wanted him to go back to plumbing. He was always courteous and kind, and seemed harsh only when he knew he was dealing with satanic forces of evil. Wisdom, brokenness, purity, and spiritual hunger characterized his ministry. I personally never saw Brother Wigglesworth wear a frown. He was always smiling, never laughing it seemed, but always smiling, and sometimes he had a humorous twinkle in his eyes. He was a man who knew that his mission was to bless and to edify God's people, to inspire their faith, and to win the lost. He always had a burden on his heart for the sick, the afflicted, and the oppressed. A Man of One Book Smith Wigglesworth used to say he would give a five-pound reward to anyone who could catch him at any time without either his Bible or his testament. I once found he had left his little testament behind, so I claimed the five pounds. With a smile and a twinkle in his eye, he got out of the challenge by saying he was not without it, but that I happened to pick it up before he did. I once ventured to offer him a small book to read which had been a blessing to me. He courteously declined, explaining that since the day his wife taught him to read and write, he had never read any book but his Bible. On that occasion, referring to the book, he said, I couldn't read it, but give it to my son-in-law, Jimmy Salter. He has books all round the room to the ceiling. When I go to America and sometimes have a time for questions, I answer what I can answer. And when I get one I can't answer, I say, my son-in-law Salter will answer that. He is a better scholar than I am. When critics asked him how he ever put his first book into print, he replied, I didn't. Reporters took down those messages, and out came that book. Some years before he died, he gave me a copy of his book, which he inscribed with a personal message to me. When giving it to me, he said, Now, Brother Hacking, don't lend this book. It's not for lending. If this book is lent, the folks won't buy it, and we want them to buy it. This book has made 20,000 pounds, or $50,000, for missionaries. That was many years ago and it's still being published in Making Money for Missionaries. The First Time I Saw Him My first view of Smith Wigglesworth was from a distance. A number of us in Blackburn had just come into the Pentecostal experience and were told of a weekend meeting of evangelist Smith Wigglesworth in Preston. There were not many Pentecostal ministers in the whole of the British Isles in those days, but there were three that were outstanding. Stephen Jeffries, George Jeffries, and Smith Wigglesworth. Smith Wigglesworth was looked upon, even then, as an apostle of faith. With his commanding authority, he had a reputation for being somewhat austere, a modern Elijah, whose ministry had been attested with phenomenal miracles. Therefore, it was with great excitement that we looked forward to visiting Preston to hear him. The assembly room at Preston was situated on Lancaster Road. It was a large room, quite central, but up a dingy stairway of 45 steps, 
The entrance to this room was uninviting, but week by week and several times during the week, a goodly company of God's people gathered under the godly and inspired leadership of the late Thomas Myerscough. From time to time, many of the leading people of the Pentecostal testimony from various countries visited this room to minister. It was this assembly that gave us three outstanding missionary pioneers to the Belgian Congo, brothers Burton, Salter, and Hodgson, as well as many others who followed them. So it was on this memorable weeknight that a small company of us, mostly young people from Blackburn, made our way to this upper room. One of our Blackburn friends at this time was a chronic invalid. She dragged herself around the house slowly by the help of the chairs and the tables. Her limbs were hideously swollen. She had not done any housework for years. She was suffering from what the doctors described as a complicated condition of rheumatism, rheumatoid arthritis, neuritis, and bronchitis. Two or three of us, especially anxious to see her delivered, persuaded her to go to Preston. It was a feat of achievement quite equal to that accomplished by the four friends who got the paralytic to Jesus. See Mark chapter 2 verse 3. With the aid of two sticks, it took us three quarters of an hour to get her from Preston Station to that upper room a mere half mile away. In those days, we could not afford a taxi. The meeting began, and Brother Wigglesworth started his message. At ten minutes to ten o'clock, he was still preaching a marvelous message on Peter's deliverance from prison, Acts chapter 12. Since our train left Preston at 10.15 p.m., we interrupted the preaching to request prayer for our sister. Brother Wigglesworth laid his hands on her and drastically rebuked the affliction. The next we knew, she was running down the stairs and we were chasing after her. She was instantly and completely healed. The next day, she did all her housework. The miracle stirred the neighborhood where she lived and led to the salvation of souls, some becoming earnest members of the young assembly. More wonderful still, her husband, a confirmed drunkard on the verge of delirium tremens, came under deep conviction. Two weeks later, in the middle of the night, he crawled out of his bed and walked the floor, crying to God for mercy. In a matter of moments, God wondrously saved him, and at the same time filled him with the Holy Ghost. Like Saul of Tarsus, upon his miraculous and sudden conversion, he joined himself to the disciples and straightway preached Christ. Acts chapter 9, verses 20 and 26. He became the first treasurer of our newly formed assembly. This was my first view of Smith Wigglesworth, a view from a distance. Little did I realize it would be followed by a much closer contact in the days that lay ahead. This seemed very unlikely at the time, but then the Lord has always been good to me in this respect. As a young man, I was brought into intimate association with some of the great men of God in the entire Pentecostal movement. All were a constant source of inspiration to me. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. Psalm 145, verse 19. The strong desire within me was to have fellowship with the men I had heard so much about, men like Stephen Jeffries and Smith Wigglesworth. In just a few years' time, that desire was to be fulfilled as I served as co-pastor of a large church with Stephen Jeffries, and soon after became friends with God's beloved servant, Smith Wigglesworth. Brother Wigglesworth had a warm place in his heart for young men. In my first contacts with him, I was in my mid-thirties. It was my privilege and joy to share his company and benefit by his fellowship. 